There's clearly not statutory authorization. The Taiwan Relations Act is almost express about that. But pursuing what the United States has hinted it might do for years in defending Taiwan would lead probably to the sort of major armed conflict that the last few presidential administrations have come to admit raise the hardest constitutional questions as to whether it's something the president can do. I'm Tyler McBrien, Managing Editor of Lawfare, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, October 10th, 2023. For decades, the United States has maintained a policy of strategic ambiguity toward Taiwan and China. But in recent years, this uneasy status quo has begun to falter, as the Biden administration doubles down on its commitment to Taiwan's autonomy, and China increases provocative military maneuvers aimed at signaling its willingness to use force to assert its claim of sovereignty over the island. Despite the devastation that war between the U.S. and China would surely bring, the two seem to be inching ever closer to conflict. At the same time, many policy assessments seem to assume that the president has the domestic legal authority to defend Taiwan in the event of a sudden and unexpected attack by China. But in a recent article for the Virginia Journal of International Law called Taiwan, War Powers, and Constitutional Crisis, Lawfare senior editor Scott R. Anderson argues that history paints a much more complicated picture. As Scott writes, An international crisis over Taiwan could thus trigger a constitutional crisis at home, one that threatens the legitimacy of the president's response and risks undermining popular and congressional support for what is certain to be a difficult war to come. I sat down with Scott to discuss his article. He walked me through the various legislation, legal opinions, and communiques through successive presidential administrations that have defined the U.S. position toward Taiwan to the present day. We also discussed how tensions between the executive and legislative branches might play out in the event of an attack on Taiwan, as well as how the government as a whole might avoid them. It's the Lawfare Podcast, October 10th, Taiwan, War Powers, and Constitutional Crisis with Scott R. Anderson. So, Scott, you just published an article in the Virginia Journal of International Law called Taiwan, War Powers, and Constitutional Crisis. But as you lay out very well, and as many of our listeners will know, uh, the question over whether and how the United States could come to Taiwan's aid in the event of an attack or an invasion by China is not a new one. But I'd like to start with a scene setter to sort of establish you know, why you're writing this article now. First, could you, could you give us a sort of potted history of of China, Taiwan, and the crisis before we start. And I realize that this is a history that, as you note, predates the United States itself. Uh, so feel free to be brief and, and take some liberties. But I'll throw that at you first. Yeah, sure thing. I'll, I'll give it my best effort. Uh, but then there, this is leaving out a lot of history, but I think it's a useful overview, um, or at least of the basics, particularly from like a war powers perspective, which is the focus of this, this analysis, as the title implies. You know, the United States first intervened in what was then China's civil war in 1950, actually at the exact same time as part of the same declaration in which President Truman announced he was sending troops to Korea. The communist revolutionaries on mainland China had essentially, by this point, chased the nationalist government, a fairly authoritarian government, to Taiwan, where it kind of made its last stand against this onslaught of communist forces. It was a controversial move. Uh, A lot of people domestic political uh, elements of the United States had been were highly critical of the Truman administration of having let it get that far. But the Truman administration had more or less decided, we don't really have a national interest in this fight. You know, we don't have a dog in it. We have relationships with the nationalist government, but we probably want to have relationships with whatever government comes next as well. They also had a lot of reservations about the nationalist government, so they weren't actively involved. But that changed when we saw the Korean War break out. Um, because Truman and his close advisors quickly persuaded themselves that this was, in fact, part of a kind of coordinated regional effort by communist forces to push throughout Asia and potentially in other forms as well, like Europe. And for that reason, they felt it was important to push back quickly, strongly and forcefully to shut down that offensive and signal uh, that, in fact, this was not something that's going to be stood for. So what Truman did in regard to China is he essentially took the Seventh Fleet and parked it in the Taiwan Strait and forced a ceasefire, saying no nationalist government is going to be attacking folks in the mainland and no folks from the mainland are going to be attacking ports in the national government, nationalist uh, government in Taiwan and a number of other islands around Taiwan, the Pescadores being, uh, or what's today known as the Pengu Islands being kind of the main ones. And this hat was intended explicitly fl- framed as saying, we need to hold this resolution of the status until the UN can weigh in uh, and until the final status of Taiwan can be decided in regards to a peace agreement through the United Nations or through the parties. At the time, Taiwan's status was actually still disputed. It had been uh, occupied by the Japanese for several decades before World War II. When they withdrew, they handed 
the forces over to uh, Chinese military forces of the nationalist government. They handled Taiwan over, I should say. But it was never 100% clear whether the intent was for that to mean that the national government of China then had sovereignty over Taiwan because Taiwan's status had been a point of contention even for, for decades and centuries prior. And so that for that reason, Truman was saying, essentially, this is, this is a ceasefire. In doing so, he never really explained what the legal basis for his actions was. He had a super extremely broad and at the time actually quite novel view of presidential war powers, presidential authority to use military force um, that his Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, spelled out to the Congress that said, essentially, the president can do this as commander in chief, can take any range of military action to defend U.S. national interest does not need congressional authorization, even though Congress, not the president, has the authority to declare war under the Constitution, and therefore this is all under his authority. That view came under some stress in the subsequent administration, in the Eisenhower administration, particularly as tensions over the Taiwan Strait really began to ramp up, and there became began to become a real concern that Chinese communist forces were going to try and take Taiwan, and that the United States, if it stuck by security commitments to defend Taiwan um, that had been made by the Truman administration, was going to end up in a war with China. And so what the Eisenhower administration did quite expressly to, in its own words, tidy up its constitutional position because President Eisenhower himself is recorded in National Security Council discussions as saying, I'm worried I don't have the constitutional authority to to go to war with China over Taiwan, is that he engaged first in a mutual defense treaty with Taiwan, uh, where they entered into this bilateral agreement. And then because tension spiked while that agreement was being ratified by the Senate, and they were worried it wasn't going to get put in place in time. And there were also some doubts about what it did as a from a domestic legal perspective, he got a congressional joint resolution authorizing military force to defend Taiwan. So Eisenhower has the super strong uh, legal endorsement, kind of indisputable legal grounds, at least from a domestic level, of having the authority to use military force to defend Taiwan. It's authorized by Congress. That lasts through the 1970s, but as the United States relationship with mainland China, communist China, begins to become more normal and there's efforts at rapprochement. And because of kind of the hangover of the Vietnam War, Congress first rescinds the joint resolution in 1974 after a few kind of false starts. Um, So there's no longer statutory authorization to defend Taiwan. And then once the Carter administration decides to normalize relations with China in 1978 and in 1978, beginning 1979, they begin the year-long process of withdrawing from the mutual defense treaty and eventually succeed at doing so despite uh, a legal challenge brought by members of Congress. So there's no longer any firm bilateral security commitment between the United States and Taiwan. Uh, And the United States takes that extra step of saying, up till now, we'd seen Taiwan as the rightful government of China. Now it's, in fact, the the regime in Beijing. You, you, the People's Republic of China, are the government. At the same time, because they wanted to maintain a very special relationship with Taiwan, uh, the Carter administration worked with Congress to enact the Taiwan Relations Act, a law that has kind of foundational still plays a foundational role in defining our bilateral relationship. That act contained a provision essentially saying the United States would maintain the capacity to come to Taiwan's defense uh, and help Taiwan in its own defense by providing arms of a defensive nature. But it stopped short of actually committing to come to Taiwan's defense. Instead, what it said, or authorizing it, as the joint resolution had done, instead what it said is that if there's a threat that manifests itself, uh, the president should bring that threat and information about it to Congress, and the president and Congress will decide what to do together, essentially. The legislative history of that act, notably, very expressly says this is intended to make it as if the president has no more authority or no less authority to use military force to defend Taiwan than if this act had never been enacted. Um, So it's very clearly not an authorization to do anything, but it's also not putting Congress's foot down against doing something. This is the status quo we've had to the present day. Um, this is still this is kind of these statutory legal underpinnings of what is known as strategic ambiguity, a position the United States has maintained since around this time, which essentially maintains: look, we might come to defense of Taiwan. We're going to maintain the capability to do so. We don't like when China threatens Taiwan, but we're not going to come out firmly and say one hundred percent we're coming to Taiwan's defense if China attacks. In substantial part because at least for a long time, there were concerns that would create moral hazard on Taiwan's part, and because there was an effort to kind of pursue what has been described as dual deterrence, providing both carrots and sticks to Taiwan and to China to try and encourage them both to stay on a peaceful path towards some sort of negotiated resolution of Taiwan's status, as opposed to either side taking dramatic actions that would escalate the relationship. 
that worked pretty well until the last few years with some, you know, odd spikes and ends. The last few years, increasingly, we've seen people worried China is actually preparing to pursue military action. Xi Jinping has pursued a hostile rhetoric towards Taiwan, an increasing pace of military exercises. People disagree about whether that means any attack is actually forthcoming or not, but certainly a lot of observers, commentators, and U.S. policymakers have expressed concern about it. And that's led a lot of people to question this position of strategic ambiguity and the United States to take much more concrete steps like sending trainers, sending weapons, work on solidifying international relationships, and otherwise adjusting its posture in Asia to try and provide a more effective deterrent to China to deter it from trying to pursue any sort of military action, which purportedly, according to some reports, Xi Jinping has directed the military to be ready to do by 2027, although it's not clear how firm a date that is and whether it's they might get there sooner, they might get there later. We, we just don't know. Does that cover the t- historical terrain enough? Absolutely. Yeah. First, I want to say thank you for that feat of historical summary. We covered a lot of ground. You, you mentioned these three sets of measures, the Taiwan Relations Act, which I'm sure we'll come back to, uh, the three joint China-U.S. communiques, and then the six U.S. assurances to Taiwan over decades, um, which, as you said, has been a, a pretty workable and fairly successful, by, by many accounts, maintenance of the status quo, uh, a relatively peaceful one. But as you mentioned, um, the past few years, especially this um, status quo has become threatened, perhaps. So you mentioned that, you know, analysts are, are predicting that a, an attack on Taiwan might look more and more likely in the coming years. There has been much ink spilled on on what an attack on Taiwan might look like. And, and feel free to jump in um, to describe some of those scenarios and war games um, that you talk about. But as you mentioned, I think one of the motivations for writing this article is that much less ink has been spilled on the legal authority to do so. Um, so I want to start there. I- I'm curious why you, why you think that. And as I was reading, uh, it, it occurs to me that this is almost the, the inverse of the uh, Jurassic Park Ian Malcolm quote when he says, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. This almost seems an inverse of that of policymakers preoccupied with whether or not they should, and they didn't stop to ask if they could legally. So why do you think that has been much less of an emphasis? And we'll start there. It's a fair question. And I think it reflects both the inherent ambiguity around presidential war powers in our legal system, as well as the kind of strategic position taken by the United States and particularly the executive branch of the United States in relation to Taiwan quite deliberately. You know, in a lot of these write ups, there is this underlying assumption the president can do what he needs to do militarily. Uh, it's often implicit. It's often there because there's an absence of discussion of a need for congressional authorization, of steps or plans for pursuing congressional authorization. There's frankly, Congress is often fairly rarely discussed, or if they, they are, it's in the context of how to approach the Taiwan relationship diplomatically in regards to a variety of steps Congress could or couldn't take in regards to signaling or assistance, things like that, but not around this question of war authorization. And I think this isn't necessarily a coincidence. Um, First, a lot of policy folks aren't really that sensitive to legal concerns in this space. Um, There's kind of a implicit understanding among a lot of foreign policy folks, the president as commander in chief has a lot of authority in this space, which is true, but fewer of them recognize the extent to which certain types of large scale conflicts are seen as raising a constitutional question, even by the executive branch. And so there's not as much sensitivity into that or to the fact that, that a conflict with China would, could or would arguably rise to that level and raise those sorts of concerns much more than more limited military action in other contexts. And there is also a deliberate position by the United States and by the executive branch to maintain that possibility. Remember, the threat of U.S. military intervention is a m- major part of the strategic ambiguity formula. The United States doesn't commit to taking military action, but it also makes clear that it's a possibility. And that's because that still has a deterrent effect on China, deterring China from pursuing more hostile action against Taiwan. At least that's kind of one of the big sticks that could be brought out against China if we were to do such a thing. To make that more credible, I think the executive branch is often hesitant to say, oh, but we're going to have to go through a process of legislative approval that might take time, might prove controversial, might not be a sure thing. So I think the executive branch is often kind of silent on the extent to which this is in the president's authority or not. It really is a hard question to address and and not a question the executive branch probably would be inclined to weigh in on um, one way or the other with, with much certainty, unless they absolutely have to, at which point it will will we'll be in the moment of that sort of policy or and legal decision 
adding to this is that it surprisingly wasn't a topic that I found a lot of legal scholarship on. Um, there's only one assessment that's a worthwhile read, uh, reaches a different conclusion than I do, that was uh, done by uh, a military lawyer um, in the last year that looked at this and said, essentially, no, I think the president has a legal authority to respond to a variety of scenarios in which China uh, might take action against Taiwan. And he kind of, the author ran through a number of these scenarios. And I was aware of the fact that that was not at least how the Eisenhower administration had viewed this issue and that there was a bit of uh, tension, I think, between that analysis and the understanding that there might be limits on the president's authority to use armed conflict in, or armed force in situations that would lead to major armed conflicts of certain types. And so knowing that, it, that's what led me down to dig into this topic. And I found a much kind of richer history and was able to elaborate and pull it out in ways that I think are actually fairly novel and new, at least in terms of pulling these threads of history together, that I think a highlight and underscore the extent to which this is actually a much more difficult legal question that policymakers need to start incorporating into their strategic planning more deliberately if they are going to put the United States on the strongest foot possible to potentially defend Taiwan, if that's what policymakers decide is necessary. Yeah, and I want to get into some of that history. One of the most surprising aspects of the article for me was the extent to which across several administrations, the executive branch was a bit self-conscious, at least privately or internally in discussions about uh, the use of force in in not needing to uh, get congressional authorization or approval. Can you take us through some of those discussions in administrations that complicate this assumption of executive branch you know, assuredness in, in their ability to use the use of force uh, or to wage war without congressional authorization? Yeah, it, it's a really fascinating history. And and I will say, I, you know, this is something that I ended up settling on doing after I'd have re- originally written the first draft of this and was like, there's actually a fascinating history here that I think actually is would make a novel contribution to kind of war power scholarship. Uh, and that is a, essentially a history of what we know as today as the nature scope duration test, which is a test the executive branch currently applies, has applied since the Obama administration and, and to some extent during the Clinton administration to determine whether a particular use of military force is outside the president's authority to pursue on his own is if it rises to a certain nature, scope, and duration, if it's of a certain scale along those different metrics. Some people treat that as a relatively recent innovation. They may like it, they may not dislike it, but a lot of people say, well, you know, that was something the Clinton administration did, then the Bush administration didn't follow it. And so it was this kind of innovation that some people say is really was just kind of a passing phase or is just kind of window dressing that doesn't really matter, or that uh, is a partisan innovation that only really applies in Democratic administration, not Republican ones. Although, as I document in the paper, the Trump administration actually did apply it routinely and and didn't challenge it. And so it at least now has survived through three administrations consecutively, Obama, Trump, uh, and Biden of both parties. But what I was aware of and what I had the opportunity to develop through this paper is the fact that it actually has a much deeper uh, intellectual tradition in the executive branch. The Truman administration position I mentioned earlier, this view that the president has essentially plenary authority to use military force, was a very consciously novel innovation at the time. Um, it, you actually saw very similar arguments being made before the Truman administration pursued them um, in handouts and in academic write-ups, where people were saying this is a new world order, the concept of you U.S. national security, national defense is much broader than it would have been in prior eras. Uh, and therefore, the idea of self-defense of what that most people accept the president can take actions in self-defense of the country without Congress in response to an emergency, the, that definition has become dramatically expanded because of these dire new reality of the post-war era, early Cold War era, where a war with the Soviet Union and or with China seemed like a, a real possibility. And the Truman administration leaned into this in the Korea context, and because they were linked, the Taiwan context. Just two years earlier, we actually just saw released through a Freedom of Information Act action uh, late last year, there was a legal opinion that the uh, Justice Department produced that reached almost the opposite conclusion. It was about sending troops to Palestine at the time. And it concluded uh, in this 1948 opinion, I mean, the Justice Department concluded essentially, you know, the president's authority is, is pretty much limited when China is sending troops overseas to defending U.S. nationals and property and somewhat discrete purposes and things that are related to that. Sending U.S. troops to just pursue a foreign policy interest is something you'd 
probably would need to go to Congress for. That was not the conclusion that carried through into the Korea conflict or uh, into the Taiwan conflict. Instead, you saw this much broader view that, again, D- Dean Acheson, Truman Secretary of State, who himself was a uh, Supreme Court advocate and lawyer, was instrumental in developing. The Eisenhower administration very openly had, had reservations about that. Eisenhower fretted constantly about constitutional constraints on his authority in National Security Council debates. And it's very interesting. My, my sense is that we have this sort of detailed conversation reflected in these detailed notes his National Security Advisor took because they were just not as sensitive to attorney-client privilege and things like that. I don't think you would see these sorts of comments in modern notes because they would be privileged and they would be kept out of most um, sorts of documents like this, except except in certain exceptional cases. But instead, we see discussion of legal issues all over the place in these National Security Council records and other records from the Eisenhower administration that really underscore the extent to which they were worried about limits on the president's authority and felt the need to work with Congress. And Eisenhower has a well-documented history of you know, essentially pursuing congressional authorization for a range of potential military actions, many of which he didn't actually pursue kind of getting preemptive military uh, congressional authorization for potential military actions to use perhaps as a deterrent as much as actual authorization for use of force. Um, and then uh, uh, and then also at times, um, uh, such as in the Dien Bien Phu incident, um, where uh, the French government had asked the United States to intervene in Indochina, in Vietnam, and the Eisenhower administration couldn't get congressional authorization and chose not to pursue it and expressly said, I'm not doing this because I couldn't get Congress on board. That doesn't mean he, you know, he didn't say the president had no authority to ask, act on his own authority with military force. In fact, he did in a number of cases, including uh, Lebanon and a few other major interventions. They were limited in scale, limited in purpose. They weren't anything that kind of beckoned a major conflict with a foreign party. Um, and that's where Eisenhower seemed to roughly draw the line. Uh, and he saw it as as much a political as a legal calculus saying, I need to get Congress on board because for any major conflict, I'm going to need appropriations and I'm going to need authorization and I'm going to need a bunch of other things from Congress. So if I don't have them on board, I'm not going to be able to succeed. Uh, and so the the exact constitutional line he expressly said at one point in a 1958 NSC meeting, uh, you know, is pretty fuzzy. We don't 100 percent know. There's no fixed answer here. But as a practical matter, we kind of have to work with Congress at least for larger scale conflicts that that need those sorts of congressional resources. Subsequent administrations on the public line tipped back in the direction of Truman asserted very broad assertions of authority. The Kennedy administration did this. Johnson administration um, were very resistant to saying we have to get Congress to do certain things. But internally, we saw a bunch of legal opinions that said, well, we think there are actually perhaps outer limits on the president's authority about different types of major conflicts. Different internal executive branch lawyers framed this differently. Um, Some said, well, uh, this is actually kind of a remote limit. It's more hypothetical for most cases. It only applies to situations of all-out war. Others were less certain, were willing to accept the possibility that it may be kind of more limited. The I think one of the most interesting ones, and it's something I encourage war powers nerds of all stripes to read, is a 1970 opinion by future Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, William Rehnquist, not somebody who is shy about executive power. And in this opinion, that is kind of notorious for signing off on uh, the Nixon administration's military operations in Cambodia, what a lot of people see as an assertion of broad executive branch power. He actually articulates a a, a fairly constrained, at least by the perspective in comparison to the Truman administration view of what the president can do on his own. He says, essentially, look, if, if we're going to accept the constitutional structure as written, we have to accept that they're at a certain point, the president has to go to Congress for authorization for major military operations of some sort. Uh, and he said, Korea is the high water mark. But he noted that even in the Korea case, actually, the Truman administration did ultimately go to Congress for authorizations and appropriations almost immediately um, after deploying troops. So there is even a, an element of congressional authorization there, if just not the sort of express type we would expect. This all came to a head over Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnam War, the Johnson administration internally said, we really need congressional authorization to expand U.S. military direct involvement in Vietnam. They held off on pursuing that until they could get congressional authorization. Um, And the opportunity they used to do that was the Gulf of Tonkin incident um, that uh, let them introduce a resolution that they had actually written months earlier and then chosen not to bring forward to Congress because they were in the midst of election. an election, brought it forward, got approved by Congress, and that became the legal vehicle for expanding U.S. involvement in Vietnam. So even though these administrations had a public line that they said, we don't think we need Congress for any of this stuff, in practice, 
they often saw it as a more prudent path to pursue congressional authorization. And you see this pattern time and time again. I mean, we saw it with, after Vietnam, it's worth noting the United States didn't pursue a lot of major military actions for a long time. The Gulf War, first Gulf War is kind of the next major incident. Um, and then in that case, we have an account from then attorney, Deputy Attorney General Bill Barr saying, you know, I told the president he doesn't need Congress to do this. But we agree, all agreed it was kind of more prudent to work with Congress. His son, President George W. Bush, did very much the same thing in around Iraq and around 9-11, had a very, very broad views of executive branch power articulated by his lawyers, but nonetheless went and pursued statutory authorization. So you've got this weird binary view where there's a difference between the public position taken by the executive branch in many cases and a private position that seems a little more conservative and is kind of expressly stated in a number of legal opinions that we now have available to us that were internal at the time. The Clinton administration, meanwhile, between these two, came out with a more public position. They kind of took this quiet internal view and brought it public and said, well, we think we acknowledge the declare war clause at least might set limits on the president's authority to use military force without Congress. And we're going to apply this nature scope duration test to say, is this use of military force the sort of thing that might lead to a major armed conflict? If it is, uh, then we are going to seek congressional authorization. Coincidentally, or perhaps not coincidentally, nothing the Clinton administration did ever rose to that level, even when it deployed 20,000 troops to Haiti and to Bosnia and other places. So the, the bar was a high one, but they nonetheless acknowledged it. And then the Obama administration took that standard and incorporated it into what is now known as the 2011 Libya opinion. The anticipated nature scope duration test is a big part of that legal analysis. And it's become this kind of standard inclusion in legal analyses under both the Trump administration, the Obama administration, and and presumably the Biden administration, although the Biden administration hasn't released opinion um, that addresses this issue yet, where they say, okay, this is part of our analysis. Now, it's worth noting they only acknowledge it as a possible constitutional limit. So they're stopping short of saying this 100% constrains us, but they nonetheless treat it as a constraint, or at least pursue the analysis to say, do we need to reach the question as to whether we are constrained by this? And again, in each case, they've determined the military action they've pursued has fallen short of that level where it's been pursued under the president's constitutional authority, not under a statutory authority like the AOMFs. Where it's under a statutory authority, you don't do this analysis. It's It's got congressional authorization. So that's kind of how we've arrived at this sort of uh, legal position that I think is such an interesting kind of paradox and pr- really gets brought to a head in the Taiwan case where there's clearly not statutory authorization. The Taiwan Relations Act is almost express about that. But pursuing what the United States has hinted it might do for years in defending Taiwan would lead probably to the sort of major armed conflict that the, la- the last few presidential administrations have come to admit raise the hardest constitutional questions as to whether it's something the president can do. Yeah, I think that brings us nicely to my next question. You, you've already sort of sketched out for us um, this history of U.S. foreign policy toward Taiwan and the attendant security commitments and the like, uh, as well as in tandem, the executive branch's views and opinions on constitutional war powers, not only toward or vis-a-vis ta- Taiwan, but also more broadly. Uh, but now you see them, as you as you said, coming at, you know, sort of into a collision course um, with with a a pending uh, or near future conflict with with China and Taiwan. Can you talk about uh, the last part of the title of your essay, which is constitutional crisis? How how do you see this coming into a collision course with each other? What are the tensions here? Yeah, I mean, it it, it really is this this hypothetical scenario that that we've been talking about. That that's the focus of a lot of U.S. policy towards Taiwan or policy discussions around Taiwan at this point, which is this hypothetical attack by China. If China pursues a sudden and unexpected attack, is how I frame it in the paper, and I, and I do that quite deliberately, um, this is a concern that many people have raised, that China is preparing to kind of try and hide pursuing some sort of attack on Taiwan that establishes a, a fait accompli, um, where they move so quickly and they seize the seize territory effectively and quickly enough that the United States is discouraged from responding because they couldn't respond quickly enough. It's kind of facts on the ground are established by China, and it, it moving quickly has that sort of advantage. There's a very healthy policy debate as to whether that's a, a realistic concern, as to whether that's something China could really do is act with that level of surprise. I don't engage that policy ba- debate or take a position on it. I'm really trying to address the legal questions that would be raised by that scenario, which is the subject of so much policy discussion. And and where you get that scenario, it really does, under the current status quo framework, present an incredibly hard constitutional question in that the president is faced with a situation where if he decides, I need to come to the defense of Taiwan, 
he has to do it on his own constitutional authority as president because Congress has been almost expressed through the Taiwan Relations Act. Again, the legislative history is not shy about it. And it's worth noting Congress has reinforced the Taiwan Relations Act in almost every piece of subsequent Taiwan-related legislation by citing back to it and stating an intent to be interpreted consistent with it. Um, the latest NDAA, I think, cited the Taiwan Relations Act 14 times, if I recall correctly. That legal framework makes clear there's no congressional authorization to undertake this sort of action. So the president would have to be acting on own constitutional authority. But we also know that a war with China over Taiwan by almost every expert projection we have would be completely devastating and be off the charts on most of the metrics we use to judge nature, scope, and duration. The the study I lean on most heavily to do this is a really fascinating study. The Center for Strategic International Studies, or scholars there, I should say, um, pulled together uh, early this year that used a, a series of carefully designed simulations that were meant to try and simulate real world operational outcomes um, about what a war over Taiwan could or would likely mean for China and the United States. And what they determined was that over the first four weeks of this conflict, that was the only period that they covered. um, And just in the vicinity around Taiwan in kind of the East Asia theater, they didn't address whether uh, there was creep into other theaters, other areas of conflict. And it's worth noting, not accounting for nuclear weapons because they excluded nuclear weapons from their simulation. They said the United States would expect to have a level of daily casualties that could be higher than the United States experience in either Vietnam or Korea. Um, we're talking about you know anywhere between 6,000 at the low to 12,000 uh, military casualties uh, or fatalities, I should say, over the course of this conflict. It is a conflict that would result in major, major degradation of U.S. military posture in Asia, meaning that the United States would have less military capability to pursue other interests in Asia, uh, a potential decline on kind of the global order. These are the sorts of consequences that the analysis executive branch has come to apply in the nature scope duration test is supposed to account for a major conflict with major consequences for the country and a major loss of life, particularly by American soldiers. Uh, and that's exactly what this study and almost every other study who's looked at this issue anticipates is a completely devastating war. And so when you're facing that as president and you're saying, okay, what are my choices here? Either I have to wait for Congress to authorize this, in which case, in just a few days, we could really suffer strategic setbacks that would undermine how effectively we can come to Taiwan's defense. Or you say, I'm going to go ahead on my own, um, which is probably strategically, militarily, the better answer if you are going to intervene and do act immediately. Um, most assessments say acting quickly is a major strategic requirement. But then this puts us in this constitutional crisis question because you're doing something that at least the last three presidents uh, or two presidents, depending on whether it's President Biden talking about or not, has strongly suggested is unconstitutional or at least raises really hard constitutional questions. And that's where the United States could find itself not only in the most challenging armed conflict of its history, but undergoing a simultaneous constitutional crisis at the same time. And so you lay out, I think by my count, three options that the president would likely take or sort of used to justify um, unilateral action in unilateral meaning, you know, without the express authorization from Congress, uh, you find all of these options uh, wanting and, and you can feel free to, to elaborate on, on why there are significant drawbacks to each option. So then you turn finally to the steps that Congress and the executive branch can take together to ensure the, the sort of speedy response necessary and, and, and legally. So if you could just sort of walk us through then those op- congressional options as well. Yeah, well, let me start with the executive one. I think it's worth kind of clarifying how I think the executive could and and likely would respond to this. You know, it's worth noting there are legal arguments the executive branch could put on paper. And I I don't really have much doubt that a president in this scenario would be able to find lawyers willing to sign off on it uh, in the executive branch and put out there and say, here's a legal basis for why what I'm doing is consistent with what. Um, the nature, scope, and duration test, right? They could make super optimistic assessments or assumptions regarding the likelihood of escalation uh, and how Cong- China is likely to respond. Um, they could draw very superficial comparisons to prior conflicts uh, about that were seen as falling below this threshold. So a classic example is any war with China is unlikely to involve any 
or certainly not many U.S. ground troops because it's all taking place in the Pacific Ocean <laughs> or over the Pacific Ocean. Lots of people are still going to die, but in prior opinions by the executive branch, they've pointed to a lack of ground of ground troops as a reason why things are more permissible under the president's own authority. But the logic of that in those cases was because it's less likely to result in a major loss of life because the other military wasn't able to hit aerial forces as easily because they weren't as sophisticated. That's just not the case with China, right? But that, that wouldn't stop an executive branch who really wanted to make a case from making this argument. Maybe they point to the Taiwan Relations Act and say, well, Taiwan Relations Act clearly wants us to defend Taiwan, even though the legislative history almost expressly says it doesn't. But that doesn't, it wouldn't make it be a good argument that the executive branch could still make it. Or maybe the executive branch would say, well, there are thousands of Americans on Taiwan and we're coming to their defense. And maybe that's a more plausible argument, particularly if China like started its assault on Taiwan by shooting at American ships in the region, then they, the executive branch might have a very plausible self-defense argument. But that argument might not be as plausible if China took steps, for example, to say, we're not going to hurt any foreign nationals, or we're going to do whatever we can to protect foreign nationals and allow them to be evacuated. There's lots of ways Congress could mitigate and undermine that sort of self-defense justification if they wanted to. And so the executive branch is left with kind of two last cases. One, they can just abandon the pretext of this move towards acknowledging anticipated nature of scope and duration test. That's more credible than these other arguments. They wouldn't have wasted the embarrassment of making kind of a pretextual argument um, that is so contrary to common sense and contrary to the analyses other experts have put out about what a war with China would look like. But it would mean repudiating the views of the prior presidential administrations and embracing an unprecedentedly broad view of presidential war powers of a sort we haven't really seen since at least the George W. Bush administration's first term, really in practice since the Truman administration. And, uh, you know, that's just something that would be happening at a moment where Congress and the public are actually historically skeptical of broad claims of executive power, um, and particularly around the military. So that's a hard, bitter pill to swallow. The most likely scenario, I think, would be actually the scenario that Eisenhower stumbled upon when he was in the presidency. And that was, he said, essentially, look, if I don't have congressional authorization I need, I'm going to act in what I think is U.S. national interest, and then I'm going to present my decision to Congress for ex- after the fact approval. Uh, and if they want to impeach me, I will submit myself for impeachment, um, having made a bad decision. There is a tradition of this in American law and politics, uh, a rare one, but we've seen similar actions by Jefferson administration, by the Lincoln administration. Uh, and there's kind of an intellectual tradition that goes back to Locke uh, that talks about this sort of prerogative situation. Um, and it's, it's maybe the most plausible way to square the circle for a president who finds himself in this scenario, but it just comes with its own costs, its own costs to the constitutional order, because it's deliberately pursuing unconstitutional conduct. Um, It puts the president in a potentially difficult position of pursuing action that might quickly be capitalized on by political enemies that might be condemned by Congress, even if they you know, aren't willing to stop it. Um, There's a, a lot of reasons why that is not an ideal outcome for the president. And that's why I ultimately say, insofar as we know this is an area that might arise and we think it's a serious one, Maybe it's time the executive branch and Congress should work together to put take steps to say, how do we put mechanisms in place so that Congress can actually weigh in, even in the event of a sudden attack of this sort? Right. So yeah, that you you laid out a few options. The last being the sort of ask for forgiveness, not permission approach. But you know, as you mentioned, just because we we know this potential constitutional crisis is coming, doesn't mean it's unavoidable. Uh, you, you mentioned that the United States is taking efforts to beef up military readiness, and there's no excuse for also not sort of beefing up legal re- readiness. So what are your prescriptions for doing that? How can the executive and legislative branches work together to to set out a domestic legal framework that is you know, ready to respond should this crisis occur? So your point's really well taken. It's something I really try and hit on in this essay. You know, my argument is 100% not that Congress should go out and pass a 1955 type joint resolution authorizing the president to defend Taiwan today, because I'm not sure we're there yet. What I argue for is that policymakers need to be sensitive to this strong need uh, or strong uh, reason to pursue congressional authorization in advance of this sort of action to the extent they can get it uh, and build it into their strategic planning, just as they are establishing contingencies to say, hey, we're going to 
deploy troops and deploy weapons and build international relationships in the event of a Chinese attack, they similarly would need to say, we have plans for taking certain steps with Congress to ensure that if an attack is to occur, as that becomes more likely, we'll have a domestic legal authorization in place to fully pursue it. So there's no legal doubt we're not begging an international, uh, a constitutional crisis to match our international crisis. Um, it is a hard lift, and, and I don't have a clear 100% clear prescription because the dynamics around how you handle a war authorization are very complicated. Um, if Congress acts too soon in providing authorization, they have to be a, provide a more broad, open-ended one. And that creates all sorts of principal agent problems that we're very familiar with from the 2001 to 2002 AUMS debates of the last two decades. Um, a lot of members of Congress, I think, are very reluctant to do that. They said as much expressly. And I think for not unreasonable reasons. On the flip side of that, however, is that if you wait too long and Congress tries to gather more information and pass a more narrowly tailored specialized authorization, uh, then there's a risk you wait too long. And because negotiating those much more fine-tuned arrangements takes a long time to debate. It's a lot more to argue over. There's a lot more space for disagreement. The executive branch is likely to push back more. So you need more extended time to debate. But as you need more extended time to debate, you're getting closer to the crisis moment because you're waiting to see a clear threat that you know you have to respond to. This is kind of a dynamic that's inherent in any sort of debate over war authorization. It's a reason why it's a challenging enterprise for Congress, and, and they're almost always criticized about how they go about it. But it's important to recognize these dynamics. On top of that, you have a really hard diplomatic angle here in that any authorization you pass, no matter when, is going to feed into this deterrent and diplomatic relationship with China. So policymakers have to think, okay, is China going to see this as an escalatory move? Is China going to see this as a dangerous move? How do we fit this into our broader effort to manage the US-China relationship? And that just complicates things further and is a very contextual, hard to predict way to say, how do we think these things are going to impact. What I say is, again, first priority is just to be aware of this need and to begin working it into and considering it alongside all the other things you need in place before a, an attack by China might take place. So to try and put it as part of the strategic planning process. I also then point to one mechanism that Congress could consider that would not be an authorization, but might help square the circle a little bit. And that is some sort of expedited procedures. Um, part of the reason why it's hard for Congress to respond to a Chinese attack on Taiwan with authorization is because it just takes time Congress to debate for Congress to debate and enact legislation. Uh, generally, even in cases where AUMFs or war authorizations were enacted almost unanimously following a major crisis, it's usually taken two or three days to actually be enacted, even straightforward ones like the 2001 AOMF, like the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. And in cases where a single, single member of the Senate is opposed to an action, which might be the case over something like this, uh, if you think of Rand Paul and some of his stances on these sorts of things, um, they can delay authorization over the objections of the whole rest of the Senate for up to two weeks in normal procedures. There's some exceptions for war authorizations, but I'm actually not sure they would apply here. So in light of all that, you could enact procedures that guarantee a debate over a fixed time period, eliminate filibuster consoles, maybe pursue a short-term limited pre-negotiated authorization to defend Taiwan for a fixed period that expires so it can be replaced by something that has been more thoroughly debated and customed and tailored to the actual crisis, and that that can then be renewed at regular intervals. By structuring procedures in this way, you can change the way Congress operates, make Congress more responsive in a way that better tracks the tempo of a particular conflict with China, uh, and therefore give Congress the opportunity to weigh in where otherwise it might not be institutionally dexterous enough to do so. But you need to think about these things in advance. You need to have these procedures in place in advance before you can do that. And that's the sort of thing I'm advocating for is that policymakers and strategic planners need to start making those plans now so that they can have them in place before things really hit the fan. So thus far, we've limited our discussion to the domestic legal framework, US constitutional war powers. And I think for good reason, because that's pretty much the extent that your essay covers. But I wondered if you give any thought to the international angle of this. You know, it's a really interesting question. Um, I had originally hoped to be able to tackle a bit of both in the piece, and the war powers questions just came together to require enough focus and analysis. I didn't want to muddy it or complicate it too much by bringing in a whole other set of legal issues. But the international legal questions are really interesting here. The, the main one that gets the bulk of focus, which I actually th think might be less of a clear issue to me than the war power scenario, 
is this question of recognition, um, because there is this tension in international law where a lot of people understand the United States as having adopted this view that Taiwan is part of China. And even though we ha- has a separate government, we see it as part of China. And that, uh, in fact, for that reason, the United States couldn't really, with international law, consistently go to war in defense of Taiwan against China, against the government of the state that it's a part of. In looking at some of the historical evolution of this stance, which which is often known as the one China policy, although I, as I'll clarify, I think the one China policy actually is a little different the way it's evolved. It's actually a little more nuanced to this, and there's a little more interesting historical record. The status of Taiwan actually from the outset ha- has been a, a contentious issue. Um, as I mentioned kind of towards the top, when Japanese troops handed control of Taiwan over to Chinese nationalist troops at the end of World War II, the Chinese nationalist government asserted, oh yeah, this is us. We now have Taiwan back. We own it. A lot of the other allies uh, that they were part of, including the United States, weren't as clear on that. That's not wasn't clearly their intent. There was some miscommunication to some extent, uh, or perhaps the nationalist government was was being a little opportunistic and asserting that claim of, of reasserting authority over Taiwan, which had a little bit of a different cultural and historical identity, much closer ties to Japan, which had occupied it um, for most of the 20th century up to that point. And so the status actually of Taiwan was really left pretty up in the air including the potential for Japanese claims to it um, until the Treaty of San Francisco in 1951, when Japan ceded claims to Taiwan. And then after that, it's really been treated as a little bit of a unusual case where the United States has, has, by a lot of my assessment, at least been careful to avoid really clearing tying Taiwan to part of China. The current one China policy acknowledges China's position that Taiwan is part of China. It recognizes China as the uh, the People's Republic of China as the government of China uh, and acknowledges China's position that Taiwan is part of China. But that's different from saying we recognize Taiwan as part of China. You know, I think all of this leads to me to the conclusion that I, I actually think in the event of a, of a Taiwan crisis, the United States may have less anxiety about the international law arguments um, because I think that they essentially treat and view the Taiwan regime as a de facto regime over this bit of territory that it is not yet committed is actually part of China, although it acknowledges China views it as part of China. And given Taiwan's autonomy and its substantial capacity as a pseudo state or as a state like entity uh, currently, I kind of suspect, you know, the United States government and possibly a number of international allies would not have a hard time quickly recognizing it as a state and then acting in its self-defense. Part of this reflects a lot of the flexibility of recognition uh, and ambiguity and the, particularly the somewhat policy-driven ways it's often used by states. But it, it, it's interesting in that the legal issues there actually aren't quite as clear-cut and contradictory to U.S. policy position as I think people assume they are in many cases. So it, it's a really fascinating issue with deep historical roots and one I, I'm hoping to have opportunity to write on a little bit more. Um, that intersects here is a separate story from what I cover in my article, but definitely worth investigating and thinking about as well. And I think as as the recognition history you gave alone illustrates, uh, the China-Taiwan case is incredibly nuanced, uh, incredibly specific and unique unto itself. Uh, but one question I had reading your essay was how much of your analysis and, and what aspects of your analysis of the broader issue of the presidential constitutional war powers uh, applies to other potential conflicts with other countries? So this is actually the topic of a follow-on or related piece that I'm, I'm working on now um, for, for a different law journal, um, which is that a lot of the problems of the Taiwan case are really reflective of a broader shift in the U.S. strategic positioning in that, as we know from national security strategies of both the Trump and the Biden administrations, the focus of the United States government's security concerns has shifted from a variety of non-state actors and certain pariah states like terrorism uh, and Iran and North Korea to near peer rivals, um, Russia and China, country states with major capabilities, major powers, with whom conflict necessarily reflects a risk of major conflict in most cases, or at least a much higher risk of escalation into a major conflict. That's been kind of tacitly recognized 
on a handful of times by the executive branch, particularly the 2018 Office of Legal Counsel opinion regarding Trump administration's airstrikes in Syria. They took very, very seriously the risk of escalation with Russia, uh, to some extent more so than with Syria, because there were Russian troops co-located at some of the bases that were struck. And the Justice Department really hit the point very hard that the Trump administration had taken very deliberate steps to avoid harming those soldiers um, out of fear of escalation and to avoid a risk of escalation. And I I think that's indicative of the fact that when you're dealing with near peer rivals, the you know anticipated nature scope duration test actually may be much more restrictive, even as for a variety of strategic reasons, policymakers may feel a need to respond quickly and assertively and aggressively and level a lot of threats to be able to do so, um, regardless of Congress's views. Um, That dynamic during the Cold War led to the kind of strange positioning I described in my piece and I described earlier in the podcast where the executive branch, even though internally they said, well, maybe there are outer limits on what the president can do, publicly would often assert even broader authority than the president was actually acting on to use military force, including in regards to very major, very real full-scale conflicts, often as a deterrent to try and avoid those conflicts with other major rivals. That does do, however, some harm to the constitutional order. It's hard to you know, say one thing, even if you believe in a, a different internally, you never act on it. Repeatedly asserting a particularly broad constitutional view, I, I do think, has a way of triggering downstream effects. And so so we face this real challenge as we, as we enter a near-peer arrival era, era in that insofar as we take seriously that there might be limits on the president's authority and a necessity for a role of Congress, as recent presidential administrations have, how do you reconcile that with the strategic demands of near-peer rivals uh, and and potential near-peer conflict. It's something I'm going to explore in this follow-on piece uh, and think about a little bit. But I do think a lot of it comes down to, as it did in this case, for me at least, to Congress and Congress finding ways to engage um, and potentially making itself more, uh, adapting its own procedures to more clearly reflect strategic realities and necessities, at least been viewed by the executive branch and by other policymakers. And that's at least one way where you might be able to have Congress have a, and maintain a greater voice in these sorts of decisions in the most dramatic cases, even as we enter into this new era. Whereas otherwise, under you know existing procedures, there may be more incentive for the executive branch to to find ways to to move around them. Well, uh, given the destruction and, and suffering that a direct conflict between the United States and China would assuredly bring, I think it's safe to say that everyone should be hoping that this doesn't occur. But Scott, as you've written uh, in this essay, hoping for the best is no excuse not to prepare for the worst. Um, So I think we'll leave it there. And I will thank you very much for speaking with me today. Thank you for having me. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare material supporter through our website, lawfaremedia.org slash support. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other shows, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath. Our latest law firm presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfaremedia.org. The podcast is edited by Jen Patia Howell, and your audio engineer this episode was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thanks for listening.